you have people whose job it is to create cigars. And while they're creating the cigars, there's a worker who's reading out anarchist uh, literature to them while they're at work, working for a capitalist. Nice. Um, so they would kind of educate themselves on, on like company time. Um, and what this, the fact that anarchist theory was read aloud in this way means that it was written to be read aloud. Hey folks, welcome to the Skeptical Leftist interview series. This time around, uh, I talked to none other than uh, the one and only Zoe Baker, uh, also known as Anarchopack. Uh, we talked about her book, Means and Ends, The Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Uni Europe and the United States. Uh, this is one of the few times that I've actually like made questions ahead of time to ask the guest and then sent them to the guest so they could prepare answers. Uh, not quite as casual as my usual conversation, uh, but I quite enjoyed this way of doing things. And if you would like me to continue doing them this way, then make sure to let me know. Um, I don't really have a good rant this time around, but uh, I guess uh, on a few days ago, there was a bunch of hateful transphobes that tried to put on demonstrations in cities across Canada. And some were very successful and others were not as successful. Uh, I haven't heard anything about uh, counter protests in the city that I live in, but in uh, Saskatoon, which is nearby, uh, there were many, if not more people counter protesting than were at the actual uh, hateful uh, demonstration. Um, of course, if you ask them, they would say that it's not about hate, it's about parental rights or protecting kids. Um, but if you want my opinion, which uh, you're here, so uh, th <laughs> those are bullshit excuses uh, for sh their shitty views on the rights of trans people. There are already some very good inter articles out about how uh, the whole parental rights argument is bad and how much it's bullshit, but I think it's all laid out pretty clearly when you ask them about the parental rights of uh, parents who want to affirm their kids' gender uh, choices. Um, they Then they claim pretty quickly that uh, kids should be taken away from gender-affirming parents and that those parents should be put in jail or locked up. Uh, so basically, it's all about par parents' rights unless you disagree with the hate mongers. And then it's fuck your parents' rights. It's all about whatever the hate mongers want. Because it's never actually about what they say it's about. It's always just about spreading the bullshit and trying to prop up these outdated ideas about people. Uh, you can ignore the fact, I guess, that the law already does what they want it to, which is to say that kids can't just do things without their parent parents' consent. Um, but also, you can't stop teachers from treating kids like they have autonomy and like they deserve respect. So how are you going to like make that law or that this policy stay, uh, be enforced? It's unenforceable. Um, but also you don't own your kids and you haven't ever people haven't owned their kids ever since the seventies when they realized that, uh, some parents are abusing their kids and that's not okay. And you don't get to just do it because your parent, you have the parental rights to do that. That's fucking nonsense. Um, not all, not all parents have the best interests of their children in mind. Like it was codified into law back in the seventies because apparently parents don't always have the best interests of their children in mind when they're being emotionally or physically abusive. Uh, so what do you think we should call it when a parent refuses to acknowledge the choices their children make reg regarding their autonomy and identity? Um, anyway, that's kind of all I want to say about that. Everybody knows where I stand and, uh, and, who, who, which side I believe is the correct one. Uh, <clears throat> there's also a couple of things going on down in the U.S. The sag after strike is still going on, but it looks like they're making progress. Uh, the U UAW, or the United Auto Workers of America, are striking uh, with all GM and Stellantis parts distribution centers being shut down. But apparently Ford is in negotiations with, uh, President with Sean Fain, the president of the UAW, saying that... Uh, Ford seems serious about reaching an agreement. So that's cool. 
So uh, remember, don't if you are in America, don't cross picket lines. And if you see someone who does, you are allowed to call them names and make them feel bad. Also, don't be a scab. Besides all that, I'm uh, I'm kind of excited to get into this episode. So here's the pre-show pitch. Thank you to all my patrons, and an extra special thanks to new patron, Nonsequently. Patrons make it possible for me to do this show, and the more I get from this, the more time I can spend on it. Uh, and why I spend that time making sure that the final product is as high quality as I can achieve, as well as I spend more of my off-shift uh, time setting up new interviews, recording, and researching. Uh, I know some people have been waiting a long time for my video explaining anarchism to non-anarchists, but I have a bunch, I have, I work a second job on my days off, so, uh, that takes a lot of my time and I haven't really had time to record yet, but the more money I get from the Patreon, the less I have to do that, the more time I have, the more likely it is that's coming out soon. Ah, uh, anyway. If you want to help with that, you can become a supporter at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Uh, you can support me at as low as a dollar a month or at a dollar fifty for Canadians. If you can't support me with money, then please hit the like button and go write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser or throw five stars on Spotify. I see I have one one star review on Apple Podcasts, but no review to go with it. So it's just a one star rating that just messes up my uh, my uh, five star rating, but does not actually give me anything to work on. Uh, I see that I'm also less than five on uh, Spotify. I'm like a four point three, I think. So some people must be rating less than five. So yeah, if you like the show, go on over there and uh, try and get that bump back up. You should also subscribe on YouTube or in the podcast app of your choice, so that you get new episodes as soon as they come out. A like or a comment on YouTube is also always good for the algorithm. Uh, feel free to contact me by messaging on social media, leave a comment on YouTube, uh, use the contact form on my website, skepticalleftist.com, or you can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And with that, on to the interview. All right, hi and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Zoe Baker, a YouTuber and uh, author of Means and Ends. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. It's kind of been a, a, a bit of a, an interview in the works. We've been talking about this for over a year now, trying to get... get uh, things going and i'm i'm happy we i finally got you on the show yeah sorry about that i was just like oh. working too much <laughs> no uh, that's it's the thing like uh life is what it is <laughs> everybody's schedule is always full we're forced to be doing all these things all the time so so i guess uh, uh just to start off uh, i introduced you as a youtuber and author but uh what else would you like people to know about you who is zoe baker um well i I'm, so I, I did my undergrad in philosophy and I kind of view myself as like a philosopher who accidentally became a historian. Okay. Um, and so I specialize in the history of ideas. I read dead people and then try to systematically reconstruct what they thought. So you know, other historians, they can say like, you know, they'll read a lot about big events like what caused this change in the economy or how did the plague affect people? And I'm more kind of narrowly focused on the ideas of social movements in the past. Um, oh, okay. And using kind of my, the skills I developed from doing philosophy to uh, better understand uh, what these historical authors thought. Um, and I specialize specifically in the, the, the intellectual history of anarchism. So you're like a philosopher of anarchism? Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of... I, I tend not to have original ideas. I'm more just really good at systematically okay. explaining what other people think. Um, but hopefully the original ideas might come later. Um, Why well, shift from just saying what this is what the dead people thought and start saying, well, this is what I think. Um, but that, that should, that, that's going to take a while, I think. I seem to recall like uh, one of the things, when I first started reading philosophy, I read uh, an essay by, I think it was uh, David Hume, and he said something about uh, 
kind of kind of gave me the impression that he believed there was no such thing as an original idea. <laughs> so yeah, I, that, that is, there is an extent to which everything you, you're going to say has been said before, um, and you can only make like incremental additions. Um, yeah. So I guess no pressure. You don't have to come up with any dra- anything dramatic. <laughs> uh, so I guess uh, in that vein, I suppose the question is, what is your political ideology? But I assume you're an anarchist. Yeah, so I'd call myself a libertarian socialist, libertarian communist, or just like an anarchist communist. Okay. Um, I'm in favor of a kind of synthesis of the best of all the movements of the oppressed and exploited, which includes, you know, both anarchism and Marxism. Right. And I think that synthesis will result in something that's distinct from both historical anarchism and Marxism. But that's a bit kind of complicated to explain. So I just say, well, I'm an anarchist. Because in terms of like strategy, I disagree with Marx and Engels and agree with the anarchists. So in, and I think right, anarchism right. is mainly distinguished from other kinds of socialism by its strategy. Um, so, so I primarily view myself as an anarchist for that reason. Yeah, I know like uh, lots of people that I know, I've discussed this with, like we kind of see like communism and anarchism are the same thing if you're talking about the end, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so in terms of a stateless, classless society that they share so, that goal, <laughs> but have different uh, views on how to create it. Right, right. So I guess, uh, so how do you tell people about uh, being an anarchist uh or anarchist communist or, or what have you, uh, if they don't already know what that is. So I generally will just say to someone that I'm a socialist who likes freedom and dislikes government. Um, so they don't think that I am like a massive Stalin fan. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it, always bad, eh? But if I were to get into specifics, I would say that I think that all systems of domination and exploitation should be abolished in favor of a society um, in which everyone is free and equal and in which uh, people cooperate with one another uh, to achieve shared goals and they form reciprocal caring relationships to maintain their respective uh, freedom and equality of one another. And I think that in order to achieve that goal, which, as we've said, anarchists share with other kinds of socialists, um, you have to abolish capitalism in the state, along with you know all different kinds of oppressive social systems like patriarchy and racism, and also say the oppression of um, children by adults. Right. Um, right. And that I, I'm an anti-state socialist. So the the vision of a socialist society I have is one in which society is self-managed by um, producers and consumers themselves in general assemblies in which everyone has a vote and an equal say in collective decisions that affect them. So people self-manage social life and they then coordinate with one another through a bottom-up um, system of federalism, uh, which means that all the people in a local area form a local federation um, and they have a Congress attended by delegates who aren't representatives. Um, they are people who are um, mandated on what to say at the meeting, but don't actually have any uh, decision-making power to like impose that decision on other people. And they can also be recalled if the group who elected them uh, disagrees with what they did. Uh, so they're not like a politician who, you know, you elect and they can basically do whatever they want until the next election and you don't actually have any right. you know, real say in, in what they're doing. Uh, and then these um, that local federation then federates with all the other local federations to form a regional federation, then the regional federations form a national and then also ultimately international federation. Um, and so in this this bottom-up system, as many decisions as possible were made at like the local level, and then coordination at various scales occurs through the, the federations of the appropriate scale for the decision in question. Um, and... I think that in in order to achieve that kind of model of state stateless socialism based on self management, you have to use um, means that are in conformity with those ends. Um, so I think that you cannot achieve that kind of a society through uh, participating in elections or um, conquering state power. You right. instead have to create social movements that remain outside of and against the state. Uh, and engage in direct action within organizations that prefigure uh, the future society. So they embody the methods of decision-making and organizational structures and values 
that we want to create. Um, so if you want to create a society based on these general assemblies, then our social movement should organize through those general assemblies um, so that you, people um, develop into the kinds of uh, humans who can create that kind of society because you don't just kind right. of, you're not born innately knowing how to horizontally associate with others or right. um, you know make decisions in these general assemblies. That's something you have to learn. And if that's the case, then well, we have to start learning now during the struggle against capitalism rather than uh, waiting till after. Um, uh, and therefore, the, I, I think that there has to be some kind of revolutionary transformation in which these social movements uh, simultaneously abolish capitalism as state and establish their own organs of self-management, um, which are then the seeds of the future society they want to create. Um, so that, that's my attempt to explain anarchism. That's, that's um, a great answer. Like, <laughs> I just tell people that I don't think anyone should rule over anyone else. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then they kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. But no, that's a great answer. But yeah, no, I, I, that's another short way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it's helpful to have kind of like a, a more comprehensive answer like that, because uh, then like, it actually can make people ask questions. Maybe they can learn more about it instead of just being like, oh, okay, well, that's just Corey who thinks that like there shouldn't be anybody, any, any rulers or whatever. Cause they kind of just dismiss my, uh, my answer usually. But so yeah, I guess the, the short answers usually have to be the starting point for specifics. Like, you know, well, what's your alternative <laughs> to a small right. group of people having the power to impose their decisions on everyone through violence? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I particularly like, I, I, uh, I particularly like the, uh, the idea of representatives that have no true power. No, they can't make decisions without the consensus of the people within their, uh, group. Uh, uh, I quite like that myself, especially given the state of politicians in, uh, the modern age. Um, so I guess how does your ideology manifest in your day-to-day -day life? I imagine, uh, like we all, I guess online, we all talk about being anarchists and, jo and joining anarchist groups and whatnot. So uh, do you do some of that? There isn't much like where I've lived for like the past, I don't know, 10 years. There kind of wasn't a lot going on. So there wasn't really much to join. And then I was just totally focused on book work. So that's kind of like how I try to contribute is I can, I can explain the ideas and people with, because yeah, I'm, I feel like we have different skill sets and I don't think my, like I, my, I, I don't think I have certain kinds of skill sets that you need to say be effective at like organizing this protest. I can't really attend because they involve standing for long periods of time and I can't like physically do that. Um, right. so I'm kind of like, okay, well I'm good at reading dead people and explaining what they thought clearly. So I'll just like hyper-focus on that. Um, and so that's what I've kind of been doing. And in terms of it, like in my like daily life, I guess I just try to like associate with other people as equals um, and like practice anarchism in that way while trying to kind of like, you know, historically there would be people who essentially spend their entire time just like editing an anarchist newspaper and writing right. things for the anarchist newspaper. Um, and I kind of, I'm trying to like do the modern equivalent of that through social media. Um, right. That's cool. I mean, like you say, like everybody's got different skill sets. I'm not, I don't consider myself a particularly good organizer, but, uh, I can sure talk. <laughs> so if people have, want to have a conversation about anarchism or whatever, then I can, I can do that. Like I can sit down and talk to somebody for a while, but, uh, yeah, I don't consider myself somebody who can get a bunch of people together for a protest either. So everybody needs, uh, there's different skills are needed all over the place. Uh, so how do you reconcile your ideology and the criticisms of it? But I guess before that, we have to know, like, uh, what are some criticisms that you have heard that have, uh, struck, uh, that made you think more about your, uh, anarchism? Um, <laughs> there aren't really any. Um, so, so like all the criticisms of anarchism I've ever come across just kind of systematically misrepresent it. Yep. And I keep being so disappointed by it. I keep being like, I would love if someone made an argument that made me sit down and go, wow, I need to like, think about this. I need to like reevaluate my life and, <laughs> and figure out what I think. Instead it's yeah. like, they, they don't even accurately describe what anarchists think. 
and then right. come up with like a powerful objection that I even have to like think about a lot in order to refute. And, uh, and so responding to criticisms of anarchism is overwhelmingly just explaining what anarchists actually think. Uh, right. So to give one example, um, a common kind of like Marxist critique of anarchism is that anarchists think you can abolish uh, capitalism, the state overnight and achieve a kind of fully communist society, um, you know, extremely quickly. Yeah, tomorrow. And if, um, <laughs> and if you read, you know, the primary sources, they're like, yeah, during the revolution, we obviously won't be establishing full communism. We'll be establishing the social structures from which full communism can later emerge. And they're really explicit about this and will continue to be like, you know, this is the we're laying the road to communism or this is only partial communism or this is um, the seeds of a future society. Like They're very careful that they don't think you can immediately establish communism overnight during a revolution. What they do think is that you should overthrow capitalism, the state in favor of you know, org organs of workers, self-management and crucially organs of workers power, namely um, armed groups of workers. Right. Um, which Marxists will be like, well, that's a state, but to like an anarchist, it's not. Um, right, yeah. Because uh, we have different like definitions of a state uh, than Marxists. Um, and so rather than having an interesting debate about, well, you know, what's the best organizational form for organs of worker self-rule and organs of workers power, mm -hmm. they instead just construct a straw man and then dismiss the anarchist proposals about how to like do a revolution. Um, yeah. And it's kind of, yeah, it's just, it's just very frustrating. Um, I keep reading <laughs> Marx's critiques of anarchism being like, hopefully this will be the one that actually <laughs> describes what they think. And every time it does not accurately describe what anarchists think. Um, Far too day, often. I'm hoping uh, one day it will, it will happen. <laughs> yeah, one day perhaps. Far too often I find that they just like, they'll post a link to a PDF for On Authority by Engels. And I'm just like, but that's no good. Like you can't, you can't just do that. <laughs> That's not a good accurate uh, uh, description of, uh, it's not a good argument against anarchism. But yeah, they've been essentially recycling the same straw men for like 150 years. Um, and every now and then they, you know, invent new straw men, but like they tend to stick to the classics that were kind of right. pioneered in like the 1870s and 1880s. Um, yeah, I was reading, uh, what was it? Libertarian Socialism, Politics in Black and Red. And early in the book, uh, it's the, I think the first chapter is like a uh, Marxist uh, critiquing uh, anarchism from, I mean, however long ago, I don't even know, remember, but the whole time I'm reading it, I'm thinking like, this is not an actual criticism of anarchism. This is just a straw man. This is not, nobody believes this. Nobody's saying that, yeah, we can just destroy society now and and tomorrow we'll have utopia. Like, <laughs> like it's just very silly to to think that we were we're that shallow. I, I just it's very strange. Uh, so, what are some things that you might say to convince someone that anarchism is correct? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I, I guess I would point to the kind of failure of state socialism to achieve its own goals. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation where you have genuine committed socialists who really want to create a society in which workers are free. Um, they really want to create what they call, you know, like a, a democratic workers' republic. Uh, and then what ends up happening during the course of these revolutions is that they create um, systems of top-down minority rule in which a small uh, ruling class, the, the, the party, uh, oppress the majority of the population. Um, and so, you know, it's not just that they failed to achieve a stateless classless society, you know, they failed to achieve communism. They, I think that the point is further, which is that they didn't manage to create social structures from which that kind of society could possibly later emerge. Right. And instead they created self-reproducing authoritarian social structures, um, which can be seen in the fact that, um, you know, when like the, the USSR wasn't able to um, ma maintain itself over time, it, they've either collapsed into capitalism or deliberately become capitalist societies like in China. Right. Um, and crucially, you know, with, res with respect to like the transition to capitalism in China, it, it's kind of framed as still being like socialist so that they shift what socialism is such that... Mm. It, it doesn't even meet the standard state socialist definitions of, 
um, socialism anymore, let alone, you know, anarchist ones. Right. Um, right. And this is something that anarchists predicted would happen in the 19th century uh, before any of these revolutions had happened. Um, similarly, anarchists predicted that state socialist um, attempts to do electoral politics. So, you know, we participate in elections and through that we can win immediate reforms and ultimately create a social force that can conquer state power, namely the Socialist Party. Um, anarchists predicted that what would happen is these socialist parties would begin as uh, revolutionary parties that, you know, engage in electoral politics, but over time they would abandon their revolutionary goals and become reformist parties. Uh, and this is what ended up happening, yeah. um, as can be seen by the fact that, you know, in the 19th century, social democracy is this revolutionary ideology that wants the abolition, the long term goal is, is the abolition of capitalism, and the state. And now when you say social democracy, people think that means like capitalism with a welfare state. Um, right. And that shift in words and, and what they mean is a product of that the, these socialist state socialist parties becoming, um, you know, ultimately reformist orgs and abandoning um, revolution, uh, which is what anarchists predicted would happen before most socialist parties had even been created. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, and you see it uh, even uh, even if you're not talking a lot about extremely radical politics, you see it even in like the the most mundane milk toast. Uh, kind of like slightly progressive politicians. They get into the system, they get into office, and then they turn into status quo warriors. Like <laughs> it's it's very like, yeah, it's easy to see how it happens all the time over and over and over again. So pretty clear that it doesn't work. What is something you personally find problematic about anarchism? So in terms of the dead anarchists, there's some kind of Eurocentrism in uh, the, the kind of theorists from Europe and the United States in particular, um, which is, you know, they were shaped by certain kinds of social conditions um, that they grew up in. And, you know, they were like a fish in water. They didn't kind of realize it. Um, so to give one example, um, Bakunin uh, thought that humans were initially cannibals uh, prior to the invention of animal husbandry and agriculture. So he thinks that initially okay. uh, humans are uh, hunter-gatherers who also uh, capture each other in war uh, and then eat them for food. Then with the invention of agriculture, they realized that, well, actually we can just enslave them rather than eating them and then get them to um, grow food for us. And that results in a better long-term uh, food production system than just kind of eating people you capture in war. <laughs> Uh, and, and this was like a surprisingly common view of human history among socialists in the 19th century. Right. Like, Kunin didn't invent this. This is like, you, you, you can read other people making a, the same point earlier. And I'm yet to figure out where they got this idea from, but like, it, it's, it's just weirdly widespread. And this obviously, obviously like, isn't true. Um, and yeah. it's kind of, you know, connected with the kind of mythologies that underlie settler, settler colonialism, where, you know, you have these kind of backward savages Right. Um, and we need to bring civilization to them because otherwise they'll engage in, you know, barbaric, barbaric practices like cannibalism. Um, right, right. And, you know, yeah. also obviously being the case that, say, in civilized societies, when there are mass famines, um, people resort to cannibalism in order to survive. Um, so it's obviously not even like, even if for argument's sake, this did happen in hunter societies, it's like, it, it's not like specific to them. But like, again, like there isn't really... They didn't have the data to back up the claims. They were like, <laughs> right, right. We're just making sweeping generalizations about like most of human history. Um, yeah, it's a very odd theory without any real evidence yeah, without to any support real, it. Well, it. It comes from the fact that, um, as far as I remember, Columbus, uh, one of the groups he, he first meet are called like the Caribs, and he hangs out with the enemies of the Caribs who claim that are oh, that they're cannibals, and Columbus then like repeats this. And this then becomes like a common like trope to refer back to within Europe. Um, okay. But I don't know if there's actual evidence that they did eat people or if it was just something that was like invented by their enemies. Um, right. Because it's just common for people, you know, groups who don't like each other to invent things about one another, sure. about why, you know, they're not like <laughs> us. They're, you know, terrible and, and weird. Um, and, <laughs> and, I, and, yeah, that, and that's where sure. the word cannibal um, comes from. Um, okay. 
but yeah, it's just that, that there's lots of weird kind of every now and then like Eurocentric uh, history or kind of like accidentally kind of excluding things that on other occasions they don't. So like there's one passage where Kropotkin says that, oh, you know, America developed an economy through freedom. And you're like, but what about the slavery? Uh, <laughs> what about all the enslavement of black people? They didn't just purely develop through like free markets. And obviously right. on other occasions, Kropotkin does talk about the slavery. But on other occasions, like he doesn't, or like there's a passage where Rudolf Rocker is like, yeah, when, you know, he, he talks as if when settlers came to America, it was kind of a largely like empty place. And, they, you know, there were people there, but there was huge amounts of just like land where no one was living. And this is like not true. This is like one of the founding myths of like America's yeah. settler colonialism. And obviously at the time he's reading, you know, these like racist historians and not realizing what's true and, and, and what's like myth and false right. and kind of uncritically like repeats their claims. Um, and so you get things like that every now and then where it's like, ah, oh, that's aged really badly. And these are people who were, you know, for that time, really radical. They were like, yeah, there are hunter gatherer societies that are actually superior to our society and we can learn a lot from them. Uh, or the you know, being against like slavery and racism being explicitly in favor of, um, you know, universal human emancipation, critiquing race science uh, at the time. So it's this kind of weird combination of like, oh, they're so good for the time or still being like trapped within that um, way, you know, right. certain ways of thinking um, that, that they haven't kind of realized a, a mistake. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, like you get the... The, the apologists for for stuff like from the past, they go, oh, well, we got to look at it in the time, not through a modern lens, right? Uh, and maybe maybe for people like Kropotkin or Bakunin, there is some of that. We uh, they they had limited information and they had uh, uh, bad information with limited that they had. So maybe we can live, give them a little bit of leeway. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's both the case that like. Well, when people are, oh, it's a different time, people didn't realize it's wrong. You can usually find loads of people who thought it was wrong, right, including yeah. usually the victims, right? So, you know, like the, the victims of slavery were aware that slavery was bad. Um, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. For and sure. obviously there were also, you know, white abolitionists who were aware it was bad. Um, but at the same time, say, even with the white abolitionists, they'll still be like weirdly racist a lot of the time. They'll be like, mm. yeah, you know, black people shouldn't be enslaved, but obviously, you know, they're inferior. And it's like, oh, no. Um, and so it's this kind of weird combination of being good by the standards of the time, but still being so like that they're fish in water. They don't notice things that we immediately notice um, yeah. because it's surprisingly hard to kind of fully unlearn uh, one socialization. And I'm sure that, you know, future anarchists or something will look back at things we write and be like, how on earth did they think this was true? Yep, um, absolutely. And that's yeah. something that kind of we will have to be aware of. Yeah, you know, for sure. We should try to unlearn everything, but also be aware that it's really difficult to. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, we're kind of here. Uh, I kind of got you on here to talk about the books. Uh, your new book, uh, Means and Ends. Uh there's a subtitle for that too. I can't. The revolutionary practice of anarchism in Europe and the United States. There we go. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't have it off the top of my head. So, so I've got a, a, a few questions about uh, the book. How far I got into it, anyway. Uh, I've I've said many times I'm probably the world's slowest reader, and then on top of it, you know, work and kids and stuff. So, uh, I only got it through a couple chapters, but. So uh, I guess one of the ideas that really struck me was the idea that anarchist theorists weren't writing for an elite few, and as a result, they wrote and spoke in a way that could easily be understood by people who may not have the same level of education. Uh, so can you speak to the ways they wrote and spoke as opposed to other types of political theorists? Um, so a lot of the big names that are still kind of remembered and being reprinted today were formally educated people from privileged backgrounds. Uh, so, you know, Kropotkin, Malatesta, Bakunin, and so forth. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that most historic anarchist like theory hasn't been reprinted because it was in uh, newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, which are in archives. And the majority of published authors in these newspapers uh, were self-taught workers who would write articles after a full day of work. Um, so anarchist theory was largely workers writing for other workers, um, which means, you know, 
it's extremely tired, overworked people writing for other extremely tired, overworked people. <laughs> right. um, so therefore, you know, that they, they, they write in a style that's like, you know, very clear and accessible um, to that target audience. Uh, and, you know, and the same was done. Speaking. Yeah, very plain speaking, like kind of part of it is to do with the fact that like printing is really expensive. So oh, you, yeah. you have to kind of fit everything onto a, a really like limited uh, sized uh, periodical. Um, and that medium imposes limits on you as a writer. So you have to cover all the things you want with this tiny word count. It means you're going to be really to the point. And also it means there's going to be certain things that like you don't go into detail with. Um, so anarchists will say they'll define freedom and then just, you know, in one sentence and then move on. Right. Or if you read, say, like a modern political philosopher, you know, writing for academics, well, they'll write a whole book on what freedom is in which they, you know, <laughs> define it. They spend a whole chapter defining it and then go through all the, you know, potential counter objections and loads of different examples that illustrate it and, and, and right. so on and go into like huge amounts of detail. Well, with historic anarchist theory, you know, you're going to get like one or two sentences and, and then like that's it. Um, maybe a paragraph if you're lucky. And, and that's just because of, the fact that they're overwhelmingly writing these short articles. Um, so like Malatesta, for example, wrote thousands of pages, but as far as I'm aware, he never actually wrote a book. Mm. Um, like the longest thing he ever wrote were, were like pamphlets. And even with the anarchists who did, you know, write books, their books are actually um, articles, um, you know, in a disguise. So like The Conquest of Bread is just a compilation of Kropotkin's articles slightly tweaked for the purposes of the book. Right. Um, Oh, and and the other thing to kind of think about is that so in in the late nineteenth century, mandatory state education systems they're only really beginning to emerge, uh, and okay. so most of the population or a huge chunk of the population, depending on the country, uh, can't actually read or write. Mm -hmm. um, and this obviously is an issue if you're trying to spread ideas through print media. Uh, and so the anarchist solution to this was not only uh, teaching people to read and write, which they did a huge amount of. They had lots of uh, schools for both children and for adults. Um, what's fun is that the, they had, you know, evening schools for workers, but because it's the 19th century, the evening schools for workers were attended by both adults and children because the children were also working um, right. because Jeez. child labor <laughs> was still a thing. <laughs> wow. Um, and anyway, um, and what this uh, led to is that, well, the person who could read would read out the paper or the pamphlet to the other workers. Um, and this was a continuation of how like artisans historically educated themselves. So like artisans were, you know, kind of, they, they owned their own tools and would, you know, produce things which they would then sell as they, mm. you know, they didn't work for a capitalist. They, they were kind of self-employed. Uh, they would have a, a usually teenage boy who would read um, books to them as they you know, made the items in question. It's kind of like okay. the equivalent of like putting a podcast on or listening to like an audio book right. now. Uh, they had to physically have a human in the room to do that for them. <laughs> right. uh, and, you know, so this is why would be why artisans were so well educated is because, you know, while they're making a thing, there's this teenage boy who's like reading, um, you know, translation of like Cicero at them or like um, wow. Thucydides. Or, you know, stuff like Thomas Paine and, and things like that. And this was a key part in the development of, like, socialist consciousness. Um, and this continues when you get, you know, kind of these more collective forms of labor. Um, so, for example, you have people whose job it is to create cigars. And while they're creating the cigars, there's a work who's reading out anarchist uh, literature to them while they're at work, working for a capitalist. Nice. Um, so they would kind of educate themselves on, on like, company time. Um, and what this, the fact that anarchist theory was read aloud in this way means that it was written to be read aloud. Uh, right. Yeah. So, for example, there'll be these really long sentences that are actually just a paragraph. And the reason why is because when you're reading it aloud, it kind of flows better. Mm -hmm. um, or they might like end their article with some really big exclamation mark, all caps statement. And that's because, you know, when the person says, you know, viva the social revolution, all the other workers listening will shout back, viva the social revolution. So it creates ah. this kind of like fun group dynamic. For sure. um, and so there's loads of features of anarchist like literature that don't make sense. And as you realize that, ah, oh, like this was written 
to be read aloud because they didn't have, you know, YouTube. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. I, I like the idea of like uh, people sh- like sharing that information while they're working in the same space and they're all getting that education. And yeah, I think that's great. And what's interesting is that so sometimes illiterate workers, they would get the work who could read to read out to them over and over and over again. So they would then memorize it like a, you know, actor's script. So they right. could then form memory despite not being able to read recite the article to other workers without wow. having to have like a physical that's that's I why i can't even, even imagine trying to memorize something like that like uh and then recite it back to people later and and that's that's amazing i like that a lot <laughs> yeah so this that kind of ties into my next question which was that uh uh anarchists are are not most anarchists are not even published in zines and pamphlets and instead perpetuated anarchism through conversation in a variety of settings. Um, and it struck me as incredibly relevant because the amount that I discuss anarchy and anarchism with people outside of any recording or any writing, uh, is it, it's ma- the majority of my discussions about anarchism are not recorded or, or in writing. So I'm curious if this applies to your modern experience of anarchism as well, or if you think it is it, of it as a strength or a weakness so i'll first explain kind of you know like the factors that lead historically to most anarchist authors not being published and then talk a bit how things are actually kind of really different now although also at the same time you know in certain ways similar um so you know aside from the fact that you know huge amounts of people at the time can't read and write um another key factor is that well in order to be a published author it needs to be printed And in order for it to be printed, you need a printing press or you need to pay someone who is like a professional printer. Um, And this kind of by itself creates a huge barrier to entry because either you don't have a printing press and don't know how to operate it or, you know, you can't actually afford it. Uh, And so what this means is that, well, you have to send, you have to submit your article that you've written to a pre-established anarchist paper but these anarchist papers are receiving so much correspondence and submissions from so many different workers uh, that they obviously can't include at all. They have to make a selection. Um, so there are you know, loads of people who are potential anarchist authors who aren't in the historical record just because an editor decided that you know, this wasn't good enough or there was, you know, it was good, but there were other things that were better. So like, you know, it wasn't included. And they would have to sometimes like, write uh, things in their... Because they would get when 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 people send in something to be published and it's not published, they then receive further letters being like, you know, why didn't you publish my article? It was so great, and so they even have to like publish things, being like, you know, actually, you know, calm down, everyone. We can't publish everyone. And there was there were some anarchist papers who who would publish like rejection letters. Oh, okay. Um, where like because people would like send in poems and then they would publish rejection letters, being like, your poem was terrible. Um, <laughs> It's a little mean. But. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, 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 they, were, they were apparently very funny. I haven't read any of them. I've just read accounts about them. But okay. it, was, it was it was kind of mean, but also was apparently entertaining. Um, right, right. But, um, but yeah, but what the, the, this creates this kind of limit. And, it, and so it means that, you know, people who have a printing press or have the funds, uh, that kind of, that creates its own kind of power dynamic. Mm. Um, because they're this kind of... Um, don't know what the t- they're like a kind of you know tunnel you have to go through in order to get your message right. out. Yeah, like and, they get to decide which ideas get disseminated. Essentially, yeah, and we'll do that based on you know their own views of what they think is best and so on. Which is why yeah. you know a classic things that happen is well, I'm going to create my own newspaper and it's going to publish things that I like and not what you like, <laughs> and this like happens a lot. Um, yeah. where people kind of go create their own newspaper after having like ideological disagreements with like the editor that they you know were previously working with. Think of a um, meme with Bender, like I'm gonna. Yeah, it is very much. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, and social media is, and the internet has kind of changed that because it's like, well, now everyone is a writer. You know, when you when you post a tweet or a Facebook status, you are a writer. So social media has kind of weirdly created like more writers than ever. Um, okay. Yeah. And and there's you know so, there's so little barriers to disseminating your message but obviously the difference is well you know not everyone has loads of followers um 
and, and not all the de- not all ideas that get sp- yeah, are spread good. widely yeah, are, are good, good. <laughs> <laughs> good. and there are incentives in social media that encourage specific kinds of things to get engagement right so like saying yeah. the most polemical thing possibly also people get mad at you so there are more reactions so that more people see the post so you get more followers and like you know that's like what andrew Wait, Tate that's did. how you do it okay yeah that, that is that's <laughs> how you do it um <laughs> Uh, that's how you know a lot of right-wing grifters uh, get get big. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And so it's kind of on the one hand, it's led to loads of positives, but also has led to you know loads of negatives. And I think there have been you know like I think the anarchist library is really good, and Libcom is really good for kind of enabling the dissemination of like you know both historical but also obviously like modern like anarchist views to for sure. a large audience. And you can just go find it if you're looking for it. Um, but I also think there's something missing, which is that, you know, with the papers, because there's that editorial component, it also means, you know, like, you know, yeah. this paper's going to have a lot of really good stuff in it because of who the editor is. Uh, well, now say, you know, there's way more stuff out there, but you have to kind of wade through a lot of it to find the things that like are, are worth reading. Yeah, um, for sure. But, you know, I, I think overall it's still like a positive because it enables, you know, all kinds of people to kind of put their ideas out there. Um, yeah, in a sense, it's it's uh, more it's more democratic, right? Like it's more uh, anarchistic because we all we all get to have our say and people get to see it. But but then I I've, I always think back to like uh, a friend of mine who Googled anarchism because I talked about it a bit and he found uh, Michael Malice was the, who's the an, or ANCAP, right? Yeah. Who's yeah. an ANCAP. And he's, it's like that, that's, that's a bad resource. <laughs> I don't want him finding that when he's looking up anarchism. Let's, right. let's go, let's go into the theory of practice a little bit. So the theory of practice is kind of like the framework that anarchists use for thinking about a human society and social change. Uh, anarchist and inventor, it is kind of just, you, you kind of keep finding it. If you read a lot of 19th century socialist literature, so like okay. it's in Marx in the 1840s and 50s, but in kind of unpublished material, uh, like the economic and philosophic manuscripts or what's called the German ideology. But, um, and Bakunin, you know, is doing it in the 1860s, but it's not clear that like he got it from Marx. So I mean, I mean, you had to kind of figure out like where they got it from, because this is a time before, you know, referencing is a thing. You don't have to be like, you know, <laughs> I got this from this book. You just say the idea <laughs> as if it's your own, um, because, you know, what plagiarism isn't a thing um, right, right and so that can make actually tracking down where ideas come from a total nightmare because it's very rare for people to ever say who their influences were or where they got this idea from so it's kind of right. a puzzle i'm yet to solve um but with that in mind i can explain well what is the theory sure um so the theory of practice claims that um you have to understand human activity as this process whereby people with particular uh, forms of consciousness, by which I mean the way in which they kind of experience and conceptualize the world, um, engage in activity, uh, deploy their capacities to satisfy psychological drive, and through doing so, change the world themselves simultaneously. So what's a capacity? What's a drive? Okay. A capacity, they use loads of different terms, by the way, so that they use capability, capacity, or power, like the main ones. Um, and when they mean power, they mean like, you know, power to as opposed to power over. Okay. Um, so a capacity is a person's uh, real possibility to do or be different things. So uh, um, playing tennis or being physically fit. So it can both be an action or like a state of, state of affairs. Um, and it's composed of two elements. So it's a set of external conditions which enable a person uh, to do or be the thing in question uh, and a set of internal abilities which the person uh, needs in order to be able to take advantage of these external uh, conditions. So if I have the capacity to play tennis, then that's composed of external conditions in the form of, you know, I have a racket, there's a tennis court, there's someone to play with. Right. Um, and then internally it requires things like, well, I know how to hold a racket, I know how to hit a ball, I know the rules of the game. Right. Um, and if I lack... The, those external conditions or those internal conditions, then I lack that real possibility uh, right. to play tennis. And so therefore I don't have the capacity uh, to, to play tennis. So they, they view capacities as inherently social um, because those external conditions include not just 
um, you know, things in the natural environment, uh, like a rock existing, but also the social relations, um, you know, like the fact that, say, I have the capacity to talk with you now of the internet is because of all these social relations that make the internet a thing in the first place. Right, um, right. Uh, and then as for, so a drive, which they also called um, wants or needs, um, okay. is a person's um, particular desires, intentions, motivations, goals, uh, values. It's extremely broad. So, you know, wanting to play tennis, um, thinking, you know, that since tennis is the best thing ever, you should do it all the time. And and these can often you know, interconnect. So these capacities and drives that they interconnect to of your forms of consciousness. So, you know, if, say, you have the capacity to play tennis and you have the, uh, the, the goal to play tennis and you think tennis is, like, really valuable, that can result in certain kinds of forms of consciousness. Say, like, you think of yourself as a tennis fan and that makes you different from people who are into football and makes you better than them. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and so it, it, there's this kind of, like, feedback system between these, like, different parts of it where they're all right. um, interconnected with one another. And what the theory of practice kind of focuses on is, well, when you deploy these capacities to satisfy your drives, uh, you also um, develop yourself in various ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can, you know, get better at playing tennis uh, and you can also develop new ones. So like you learn whole new techniques that you didn't have before. And it can also, you know, change the pre-existing capacities and drives you have. So like, you know, you used to say be really into table tennis, but since you got really into tennis, now that like that drive has faded over time. You've lost that interest, and that's right. a product of the kinds of activity you're engaging on on a daily basis. So it kind of leads to you thinking of people as these kind of complex processes that are continuously uh, modifying themselves as they engage in activity within specific social contexts. And this social okay. context is crucial um, because. It kind of both enables you to do certain things, but also constrains it. So, you know, that the social environment enables you to learn tennis and to get really good at it, but it also constrains you, say, you know, if you're going to play at tournaments, you have to um, follow these specific rules independently of what you think. And that shapes how you develop in a way that's different if that social context wasn't there. And you could just, you know, change the game to be whatever you wanted it to be at like a competitive level. Right. Um, and that enabling and constraining aspect uh, makes social structures self-reproducing um, because as you're engaging in activity, you're becoming the kind of person who becomes capable of and driven to reproduce the social structure um, itself. Okay. Um, and, and this you know, obviously varies between different kinds of societies and different historical periods uh, as what activities people are engaging also varies. So, you know, if I was raised as a warrior in ninth century Norse society, I'm going to engage in forms of activity that are going to develop me in a specific way. So I'm going to think Odin exists, enslaving people is great. Um, my goal in life is to die in battle, so I go to Valhalla. Um, right. And these, you know, co- the, these capacities drives in consciousness are no longer widespread in modern, say, Denmark. And that's because people are engaging in different kinds of practice and so becoming different kinds of people. Um, Okay. And and this is kind of what anarchists use to think about like social structures um, in a way that is centered on, um, you know, uh, how how there's always this kind of double production. So you produce a particular thing um, like a good or service and you also produce the capacities, drives and consciousness, which are exercised, developed and created during the activity of production itself. So then you can start to think about social structures in terms of, well, what kind of people do they produce? Mm. Um, and so you can look at like capitalism and the state and be like, well, they produce people who, you know, think there's no alternative to the, these, this, this kind of society. Uh, they will um, put other people on a pedestal or they'll, you know, oppress other people uh, in, instead of, um, you know, being able to like, collectively self-manage within general assemblies. They're just used to like, well, my manager tells me to do th- these things. Um, or, you know, they're a manager who's just used to ordering people about. Um, right. And so this, so therefore, if you want to create, you know, different kinds of people, so people who say aren't oppressing each other and are able to like freely associate, then you need to uh, create new social structures, which 
are constituted by new kinds of practice and therefore produce fundamentally different kinds of people to you know, our, our, our dominant ones. Right, right. Um, and so this then underpins like anarchist strategy, right? Which is that, well, why do they advocate prefiguration? Why do they think that social movements should prefigure the future society and embody the kinds of decision making and organizational structure that a future society is, is to contain? It's well, it's it's because they're constituted by these forms of practice that are going to produce people who are capable of and driven to uh, create the kind of stateless socialism they want to create. So, you know, when you make decisions in a general assembly, you're not just making a decision, you're also changing yourself in various ways. You're coming to think that, well, you know, turns out human beings can cooperate with one another, or you, you learn, you know, the ins and outs of like a consensus decision making process, which you didn't know before, which then makes you better able to um, organize in that way. And so therefore able to, you know, create that kind of a socialist society. Um so yeah, that that's the theory. I hope I explained it. Why it's really complicated? I think, yeah, I think I think it uh, it makes sense. I'm trying to, if I were to apply that to uh, my earlier comment about uh, the politician who goes in thinking they can do some progressive change, and but then they are changed by the system that they're within, um, yeah. because they're say they they have to compromise on one thing, so then they they start to. Uh, you know, become a person who compromises about these things. Yeah, well, they, and, they spend all day in meetings, hanging out with other politicians, and in turn shaped by that. Um, right. Yeah. So, so the things, the environment that we are kind of enmeshed in, and the uh, world that we exist in, and it it's changed by us, but also we're changed by it in a way. Yeah. So that's like what Manitas says. So he says, like, man makes society what it is, and society makes man what they are. So we have a kind of feedback loop. There's this three way interaction between, you know, the activities you're engaging in, the social structures which you're, you know, part of and are acting in, and also then your consciousness about what is happening. And so that's, they, they think in terms of this like simultaneous three way interaction between these different components. In order okay. to explain things like, well, why is it that politicians keep betraying, uh, you know, their commitment to socialism? It's well, why it's because of the forms of practice they're engaging in and the kind of social structure they're participating, which affects them independently of their intentions. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it feels a little deeper than uh, <laughs> that. I maybe uh, we can get into fully in this show, but I guess. Uh, that's why there's an entire chapter in the book about it. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like <laughs> there's so many definitions that need to be made and like right. different components to establish. That it could be like it could be difficult to like succinctly explain in a way where it like makes sense. Um, but I I tried. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I appreciate that. You'd, I think I think you explained it fairly well. Like uh, based on what I've read of that chapter so far, and uh, also like it, it does. It does fit into the way that I already kind of see things working in the world, right? Um, so I guess early in chapter one, you say that the point of defining anarchism isn't to find the one true meaning of anarchism, but rather is meant to refer to the way that it was used in a particular time and a particular setting so that one can better understand the context surrounding its use. So does that mean there is, is no true meaning of anarchism? And does that leave the term susceptible to co-optation the way that anarcho capitalists have attempted. Um, so I first, I guess I should explain how I think about definitions. Um, okay. So there's this line in Nietzsche, which I quote in the book, which is only something which has no history can be defined, um, which is like a banger of a sentence. But, but what yeah. it means is that if, if you look at things which are kind of outside of human history, um, like say, you know, subatomic particles, um, what constitutes these things doesn't vary between human societies. Um, so you can establish this kind of really systematic definition, what you have here, the necessary and jointly sufficient conditions that make, say, um, you know, H2O, H2O, and make mean it's water. Um, you can't do that with something like Christianity or anarchism or Marxism because they're just constantly changing. And even at a specific historic moment, Everyone who uses the label, that there's so many disagreements between them about what it means and about what it should mean, and they're constantly in this process of contestation where they're kind of fighting each other mm -hmm. over the meaning of the word and trying to establish their interpretation as dominant. 
and these processes of contestation then in turn will change what it is. So these historical right. entities, you know, they, they have a beginning, right? So, you know, it's, it is the case that Marxism does emerge in the 19th century and didn't exist before, or that, you know, Christianity emerges at a certain place in a certain time and is different from, say, you know, the religion of, of Vikings, which right. has its like, own history. Uh, but, but during the course of its history, once it's emerged, it's this kind of configuration of different elements that is constantly shifting and being modified, right? So, like, you know, Christianity has changed when the Bible is kind of formally constructed and, you know, certain right. books are, like, deemed unworthy of being included in it. And then it's changed again by, say, you know, the creation of uh, Protestantism. And then it just continuously, like, you know, modifies uh, as, right. as people, you know, have new ideas, argue with one another and, and so forth. And so when you're, say, trying to define it, you have to kind of incorporate that change into it. And right. rather than, you know, if you construct a definition that applies to every single thing that people have used the word to refer to, uh, you end up with definitions that don't really tell you much and often struggle to distinguish it from kind of other things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to give an example, you might define Marxism as, oh, you know, the belief in historical materialism, which is like Marx's theory of history. Well, the problem with that definition is that if you read Marxists, they will actually really disagree with each other about what historical materialism is, and they don't right. actually have a common view of what it is. And then if you go for the most kind of broad brushstrokes version of that, like say, you know, they think the economy is a key factor in history, well, then, you know, Marxism apparently was actually founded by members of the Scottish Enlightenment in the 18th century. Um, right. you know, did think that the economy was a key factor in history and you could like distinguish different societies by like their economy, which is like Marx like reads them as influenced by them. Um, or you have the problem that while well, loads of anarchists were historical into historical materialism, does that mean that like they should be included in Marxism? And obviously loads of Marxists right. would be like, no. Um, <laughs> and you can keep doing this, you know, depending on like, you know, which thing you pick out. It's kind of, uh, it becomes a nightmare very quickly. Uh, and so therefore, I try to go, well, there's not going to be any uncontested definition of, say, anarchism or Marxism. Right. And what you're best able to do is go, well, look, there's this tree and it emerges at a specific time and then it goes into loads of different branches. Some branches are bigger than others, but it's constantly growing and changing. I'm going to pick the branch that I'm interested in and define anarchism from their point of view. Ah. Um with the you know caveat that or well, there are other branches that have a totally different set of ideas and happen to use the word for quite kind of arbitrary reasons, but they have a similar root, you know, like they developed out of certain kinds of socialism that existed like in the in the, when socialism was first arising in like the 1830s and 1840s. Right. Um, and, and so I, you know, pick that and go, well, this is what anarchism is. And this is what historic anarchists would do all the time. So they would be like, anarchists think X, or anarchists think Y. And they then proceed to say something that, like, you know, you can find people who call themselves anarchists who don't think that, right? So they'll be like, you know, anarchists advocate violent revolution. And it's like, well, Proudhon called himself an anarchist in the 1840s. And in, like, letters, he explicitly argues against violent revolution because he doesn't right. think it's going to actually create a stateless society. Um, and so I kind of take that approach. Well, I'm not saying, look, this is the one true anarchism because I don't think that really makes sense descriptively, given that, you know, right. Throughout its entire history, everyone is, you have this process of people who both call themselves anarchists and argue with one another about like who is and who isn't the true anarchist. And everyone is like, you know, there's no agreement on even who to exclude and who to include because they were like different views on that. Yeah. Uh, and this obviously continues up to the present with, you know, anarcho capitalists were like, we're going to start calling ourselves anarchists. And then, other, and then, you know, socialist anarchists were like, no, you're not, you're not anarchist. That's just like the latest version of this like thing that's been happening as long as people have been calling themselves anarchists. Right. And so it is still the case that, well, anarcho-capitalists aren't anarchists in the sense that they don't have the same set of beliefs as, you know, this social movement that arises in the 1860s in the First International, or they don't have the same belief system as Proudhon. Um, right. Those things are still true. And in that sense, they're not anarchists. But, you know, were they to become, you know, the majority of people in the world... Well, then the meaning of the word anarchism would change, and that would be become yeah. what anarchism is. That yeah. doesn't mean that, um, that that doesn't affect the history of, 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 of the term or how other people have used it. It just reflects a change in the meaning of words. Uh, yeah. And crucially, we can fight that change and be like, this is, I don't want this to happen. And, and yeah. that's just like, 
to something humans do and always will do. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I quite like that. And uh, I've had uh, similar experiences with even just like the word radical or, or things like that, like uh, because it's been applied to like uh, the radical right uh, in some ways. And you go, well, is that the right use of that word? Is that going to be helpful in, in, in this context? And it just because words change and the context changes, then sometimes sometimes things uh, don't mean what we there, there is almost no one true definition of many, many types of ideas and words. Yeah, you end up just having to be able to say, well, this is how it was used by this group of people and the way you're using it doesn't match with that. And I think yeah. we shouldn't use it in the way you're using it. That, that's ultimately what you end up having to say. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I like that. I think that's a, rel- a, a, a valuable uh, uh, like point in a, in a discussion and to say like, okay, well, uh, speaking of Michael Malice, you go, well, Hey man, I know that you have Bakunin's uh, a chapter from Bakunin in your your book or whatever, but he wouldn't have used anarchist in the way you're using anarchist. Yeah, and then he would have like really disliked it if he knew this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You speak briefly about other stateless free societies and how they may or may not be anarchistic, but that modern modern anarchists can learn from them and engage with them in ways that can be helpful. Did you have any particular groups or communities or societies in mind when you wrote that? Um, so the main thing I was thinking about is there's this kind of like gap in historical anarchist theory, which is there'll be like um, in a stateless society, you have to have social systems that reproduce statelessness and ensure that a new ruling class doesn't emerge and oppress everyone else. Right. I don't think, you know, humans are like naturally wonderful. They think that some people... Uh, you know, have a kind of drive to oppress others and in the right social context that can result in, you know, all these like terrible things. And so we need to have systems in place to respond uh, to that, to make sure that, you know, it it doesn't grow into this like massive social structure that like oppresses everyone. Right. Um, And they then don't really go into specifics. They just say, this is a thing that should happen, uh, but people in the future will figure that out. Uh, And I think a key source of inspiration for this kind of question is the anthropology that we now have that they didn't have access to mm. on, on how really existing state societies uh, function. Um, so right. there's an anthropologist called Christopher Bohm, and he wrote a book called Hierarchy in the Forest. Okay. Uh, and in that book, um, Bohm argues that if, if you look at kind of what he calls egalitarian state of societies, um, they're not automatically... Um, stateless or, or kind of egalitarian but there it's in these social relations are instead the product of people in these societies intentionally creating social norms to realize their political vo- goals so you know just as we have our political philosoph- philosophies so too uh, do they um and just as we might you know come up with different systems to realize our goals uh, uh, the same was, tr- was true of these people Okay. Um, and so he then lists the kind of mechanisms that stateless societies that he studies uh, use to prevent the emergence of, of a hierarchy hierarchy at a societal level. So sometimes these societies do still have like patriarchy, for example, um, mm-hmm. where you know men will oppress women, but that's like in the pri- in, you know what we might call the private sphere. But there isn't, say, like a you know a ruler in public who can do whatever they want to everyone. Um, I did by the. the this isn't the case for all of them, but some of them are still patriarchal. Um, okay. Now, one of um, the main ways that these state societies um, do this is, you know, through horizontal decision-making processes. So they, you know, make decisions through uh, unanimous agreement. So everyone in the community has to agree on the decision rather than you know, one person ordering everyone else about, which obviously, you know, anarchists independently also came up with and, and do. Um and um, th- th- if there are leaders in the society, they lack coercive powers, and instead mm. they have to just um, persuade people. So they have to be really good or- um, orators, but don't actually have the power to command others. They have to persuade people. Ah. Uh, and there are all these social norms on the leader, um, which are there to kind of stop them getting, as it were, like too big for their boots. So, you know, it's expected right. that you're modest, that you don't like, you know, have emotional outbursts and like shout at people. You're really good at resolving disputes. And, and crucially, one of the main things is that you're generous. So you're expected to um, share, you know, huge amounts of your possessions, um, especially towards people in, in need. 
which means that often in these societies, the leaders are actually the people with the smallest number of things in the entire group because they have to keep giving away everything that they have. Right. Um, because if they don't, everyone gets mad at them. Um, that and, sounds and, and, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And, and so you know, they have their own system of like checks and balances that, again, they've like intentionally come up with. It's right. not like, oh, they're just naturally like this. It's like, no, they have their own political philosophies and value systems. Um, yeah. and, and they develop what Bohm, in some places he calls them um, reverse dominance hierarchies. Um, in other, he just calls them, you know, like social sanctions. Okay. Um, and these are kind of community responses to behavior, which threatens the autonomy and equality uh, of the group. So if someone starts, you know, bullying other people or being really selfishly greedy or ordering everyone about, acting as if they're better than everyone else, or, you know, and it's most extreme, obviously, you know, engaging in acts of violence. Uh, they have a system of sanctions uh, to counter that and, and kind of neutralize it before it creates this kind of, you know, kind of, kind of like a mini state, like a kind of hierarchical society. Right. Um, and so, you know, that, and these are like, a, they have a kind of like spectrum of resistance depending upon the behavior and how long it lasts, right? So, you know, they might begin with stuff like, well, they're going to publicly criticize you in front of everyone else. They're going to talk about you behind your back. They're going to make fun of you. So they often like, use like humor to like ridicule people and they start you know, acting as if they're like better than everyone else. So you might like impersonate them in front of everyone and then they're embarrassed and then they start, right. you know, acting as if they're better than everyone else. Um, just ignoring what they say. So if some leader starts, you know, issuing orders, well, you don't have any mechanisms to make us actually obey this. We're just going to give you the silent treatment essentially. Right. Um, and so they'll just act as if they haven't said anything. <laughs> um, and, and obviously, and in the cases of, for example, you know, someone like commits murder or sexual violence, they can be like, you know, just excluded from the group, um, right. which can sometimes result. Like I remember reading about, it was a society that was entirely composed of people who'd been kicked out of other society, other hunter-gatherer societies. Okay. So they're all kind of like, you know, basically murderers who were having to like live together um, <laughs> because that no one else wanted to like live with them. Um, That's interesting. Um, but they, and in some cases, in some societies, you know, the ultimate one is, is execution. Um, although it's weirdly the case that often no one, in some accounts I've read, it's like people... They, it's not like in living memory that they've had to execute everyone, but there are stories about, say, like a shaman who started acting as the rule of everyone. So one day everyone got together and killed the shaman. Um, oh. And so in a sense, this it, it kind of, I have a question of like, you know, is this kind of like a tale that everyone tell, tells so that, you know, any shaman in their society knows that if you, right. if you yeah. start acting as a ruler, we're going to make the story a reality. Um <laughs> I, and I'm sure if it's, you know, in oral history, it probably is based on something that did actually happen. Um, it, it's just not always clear, like, you know, is this something that you yourself have done and witnessed or if this is like, you know. How, yeah, you, how far back is yeah. it kind of thing? Um, but but this anthropology, I think, is really relevant for like, you know, contemporary, say, anarchist groups where it's like, you know, you have to intentionally and deliberately set up how is your group going to respond to, say, you know, if, if like uh, inter, inter, um, intimate partner violence happens in your group, mm. you shouldn't just like, you know, wait for it to happen and then respond on the spot in a way that isn't well thought out. You need to intentionally create a system and think about things in the way that these like groups, uh, these the kind of really existing state of societies do. Um, and that a lot of their kind of social sanctions, I think, you know, are like, uh, are effective. Although obviously I'm not saying that mm. like... <laughs> You know, you, you should like murder someone in your anarchist group. Um, if, 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 you, if, if, if they ask, uh, they yeah. act a little bit too much like they're on top of the other people, and that's yeah, I'm, it. I'm not necessarily <laughs> suggesting that, but but I still I, I think there are you know it's it's a source of inspiration of there's this stateless societies have to reproduce themselves. You know, horizontality is 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 something you have to maintain. It's not just like we reach it and now everything's fine, and so you have to develop social structures that, that enable that. Um, and that's something that, you know, historical anarchists kind of, they sometimes mention that, you know, state the societies have this, but then don't go into details. Um, so they'll be like, you know, there are these tribes and they have these systems to prevent um, what, called, what they call sorcerers uh, from having too much power, but then don't actually go into specifics. Um, but so, so I think this kind of modern anthropology, I, I found like very uh, interesting. Yeah, for sure. It makes me think of uh, like uh, 
I guess in a sense, it's related to your earlier que- answer about uh, uh, how, like, about anarchism and how, like, uh, you have people who can be representatives, but they don't actually have power and they can be easily recalled and like stuff like that. It's like you have to design this in such a way that that person can't just take over and be in charge of, you know, and, and rule over people. Yeah, exa- exactly. So like anarchists, you know, historic anarchists did have their own, you know, proposals about how, how to like do this, to, you know, to some extent, right, with like we make decisions in general assemblies, we elect delegates, we can recall them. Right. Um, it can be, it's really hard to find actually any details about like, you know, how did they respond to issues, say, with like, you know, sexual violence in the movement. It's just because it's like there was a lot of patriarchy, right. but then they don't, it's not, it's really hard to like find discussions of it. Every now and then it will be like, you know, there was this woman, she, you know, she, she was raped. And then the guy in question was just kicked out of the movement. Um, okay. So, you know, they would like expel them. Um, but, you know, in other, but in other cases, obviously, like I'm sure that didn't happen and they, you know, would not believe the woman and so on because, you know, patriarchy yeah. is a thing. Uh, but it's really hard to get like any details. I've been ages trying to find like, cause, you know, I was generally interested, like, you know, this must have been an issue. How did they respond to it? And it's like, well, I don't actually really know. Um, right, right. Yeah, I think, I think it's the uh, uh, Margaret Kiljoy's podcast, Cool People Who Do Cool Stuff. Uh, she often talks about like anarchists and, and uh, some more than zero times it's been like, well, it turns out he was kind of sucked as a husband and, and, you know, as a father, he was kind of abusive and whatnot. And it wasn't really addressed in, in the other stuff that he did with some of these historical dudes. Yeah, no, that, that will be the case. And it will be even be like, so there's like one really famous French anarchist called Sebastian Fowle, who like was a, like he, he was a pedophile who sexually abused multiple children. Oh, geez. Uh, and you know, he was caught by the police, but then he just told the movement, oh, this is all just lies by the police, you know, trying to, like, make anarchism and me look bad and destroy the movement. And obviously mm-hmm. the police did lie a lot about anarchists, so of anarchists at the time, you know, they believe him, yeah. um, which, you know, was a mistake. Um, and, and, you know, that's, like, the most extreme example I know of kind of, like... Because, right. you know, if you read him, he's, like, you know, really hardcore on freedom and being against domination and mm. you know while he's writing this stuff he's also you know doing the most horrific thing a person kind of can do to a child right um well you know still i think you know internally thinking of himself as like a genuine anarchist um right, that, that's right. like that's the that's the worst example i'm aware of like, other stuff is less extreme it's like yeah he really should have done more housework you know it's kind of stuff like that um right yeah that that's a pretty extreme example that's yeah that's Something that uh, I guess it's it's easy to see it in hindsight, perhaps, and and harder to see it in the moment. Well, yeah, yeah, because obviously, yeah, it's it's not clear like how much information people had about yeah. you know, and they didn't trust the police, but also like there is definite stuff in the trial and the police like you know reports, which is like yeah, no, this happened. Um, right, right. Kind of trying to understand why they made the wrong decision, but also being like, that was the wrong decision. You shouldn't have done that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. One of my favorite things about anarchism is the fact that it wasn't handed to us from the great anarchist theorists of the past, but instead is a kind of a compilation of variety of thinkers from a variety of backgrounds whose goal was to build a liberatory society. Why do you think anarchism has avoided the same kind of worship of a particular writer that we see in other political theory? Uh, how universal is this lack of hero worship or is it, or do we lack this hero worship? Cause we, like we say, we do see many people quoting various uh, anarchists from the past. Um, so okay, fun fact about the history of the term like anarchism and Marxism. So, so in, in the first international, which is this like group of um it's kind of like there are different groups in different countries of like uh, workers and they form this international association to help coordinate like, their struggle. Um, and within that organization, there's this big feud between the supporters of Marx and Engels and the supporters of um, Bakunin. Um, okay. Although, you know, it's, it's, it's more than that, but this is like simplification. And what happens is that um, the anarchists call supporters of Marx and Engels Marxists and Marx and Engels call supporters of Bakunin Bakuninists. And okay. this is the origin of the term Marxist. 
Um, so you, Marx never calls himself an anarchist. It's a sorry, Marx never calls himself a Marxist. It's an insult right. invented by anarchists. Uh, okay. And what happens is that well, people who like Marx like okay, sure, we're Marxists, and the anarchists are like, no, we are not Bakuninists. <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting. And yeah. I often wonder like how different would the subsequent history be if you know the Marxists had adopted a different word or the the anarchists have decided to call themselves Bakuninists or whatever. Right. Um, because what subsequently ha happens, you know, with Marxism is that, well, as new forms of Marxism arise, they're usually named after a man. So, you know, right. Marxism, Leninism after Lenin, Maoism after Mao, Trotskyism after Trotsky and so on. And right. this obviously isn't universal, right? It's like council communism isn't called like Anton Panikoism. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know, but it's a general trend and that isn't, and nothing like that happens in in, in like, in anarchism, whenever they come up with labels for themselves, it's based on like their goal or how they organize. So like, you know, I'm an anarcho-syndicalist or I'm an anarchist communist. No one says they're Kropotkinist. There's like right. one example. So there's an anarchist called Luigi Galini. And there's one example of someone who likes him being like, yeah, we're Galiniists. Um, but like, I've never found um, That's any, any, anyone else using the term. <laughs> He's using it in kind of like, you know, not in the sense of like, this is how I identify more like, you know, yeah, we really like Galini. And, and so if you're going to attack us for that, then okay, we're just going to double down on it. Um, it kind of, had, I know it kind of gave, gave that vibe. Um, okay. And so when anarchists kind of identify with things, it was primarily based on like what newspaper they subscribe to or what their favorite newspaper was. Okay. Um, rather than, you know, the name of a, of a, of a person. Interesting. Um, and you can also kind of contrast like how anarchists and Marxists argue. So if you like read kind of historic Marxist literature, so much of it is them just kind of quoting what Marx and Engels say and then adding their own commentary. Right. Um, so, you know, that's like what Lenin's state and revolution is, right? It's like, here's what Marx and Engels think about this. And here's like my interpretation and what I think, you know, how we should like apply it. Um, and then when other Marxists read state and revolution and disagreed with it, they would write responses in which they would just quote Marx and Engels back at Lenin, including sometimes like the same passages that Lenin quotes, and then just interpret it differently or argue that, you know, he's misrepresented Marx and Engels and so on. Oh, okay. Um, so they kind of just like, they are, and this happens, you know, not, this is just one example of this happens in, like loads and loads of times. So they, they just quote the same passages at each other and then disagree um, about right. how to interpret them. And that's how like they argue rather than just being like, I think this and you think this, and here's an objection. They have to like frame it in terms of, well, you know, are you abandoning what Marx and Engels thought? Um, with the term for which was like revisionism. Right, um, right. Now, anarchists never argue like this. That they never, they, they basically never quote what the early anarchists thought. They just say, this is what I think. Um, uh, they'll never be like, you know, Bakunin said this, so we should think this. And even when they like repeat ideas that say are from like early anarchists like Bakunin, uh, they never attribute it. They, 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 they just they just say the idea without being like, you know, here's a quote uh, to show it's like properly right uh, from the source. Um, and this goes alongside. So like when Kropotkin first becomes an anarchist, he visits uh, the the uh, Jura region in Switzerland and hangs out with these anarchists in the Jura Federation. And one of the things he really likes is that like, when these workers argue with each other, they never make appeals to Bakunin. Um, right. They just they just say what they think, and he's and because they kind of treat Bakunin as if he's just like you know another dude who they really right. like, but he's still just another dude. And the one time they did make an appeal to Bakunin is when a guy was being sexist, and a woman responded by being like, you know, if Bakunin was here, he would basically like have a go at you. Um, mm. And that's like the one time Kropotkin remembers Bakunin being like used in that way was to like essentially call out sexism and be like Bakunin wouldn't stand for it because Bakunin was actually, he was a feminist king. <laughs> he, was, he was, he was really good on gender for the time because in part because of like, he was very influenced by his sisters. Nice. Um, anyway. Um, and another weird part of like anarchism is that like, so, so when you read the papers, a lot of the time articles aren't actually attributed to anyone. Okay. So, so, you know, you know, you're reading this paper, like the social question, but you don't, you're not told the, the name of the author. Um, ah. And so what this means is that like, if you want to compile like the complete works of my testament and Kropotkin, a lot of the time you're going to have to go through all these papers that you know they wrote for or edited and look for things that match their style and ideas. And sometimes people get this wrong. So like there's this article, 
uh, which advocates like immediate violent confrontation of the state using you know bombs and pistols and knives. Uh, okay. And this, for years, was attributed to Kropotkin, um, oh. uh, just because it appeared in this newspaper. Uh, and actually, it was by a guy called Carlo Caffero, and we know this because there are letters between Kropotkin and Caffero, where Caffero is basically like, hey, can you publish this, bro? And he's like, okay, even though I don't really like it. Um, oh, okay. And, 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 and so that also then means that, like, well, you might be quoting Kropotkin without knowing you're quoting Kropotkin because you're just quoting this like specific paper. So that also kind of has a tendency to kind of push against putting people on a pedestal. Um, right. But there was still, you know, hero worship in anarchism, right? So like when Malatesta returns uh, to Italy, having been in exile, he's kind of treated as this like celebrity. Right. And he dislikes this so much that he like writes a whole article being like, you know, stop <laughs> putting me on a pedestal. Uh, don't treat me like this. It's it's both bad for me because it makes me you know think I'm better than everyone, and also you know bad for you because you're, by putting me on a pedestal, you're like lowering yourselves. Um, right. And so you know just wants to be treated equally. Um, and Malatesta also writes an article where he kind of complains about how Kropotkin was viewed as so kind of like intellectually sophisticated because he's you know from a privileged background. He's a scientist. Um, he, he he's this kind of man of learning. Those okay. ideas were kind of venerated and not critiqued because, you know, Kropotkin must be right because look at all the things he's read. Look at um, how smart he is. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so then people wouldn't object to his ideas. And Malatest thinks this had like a negative effect on the movement because certain things that should have been critiqued weren't. Um, and, and, you know, so, 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 there, the, so there was still, you know, instances of hero worship. But crucially, there was, you know, reactions to it. So like to give an example, Kropotkin's, you know, ultimate bad hot take is when he um, kind of abandons his previous views on like um, internationalism uh, and supports the French in World War One. Okay, yeah. Which he does try to give an anarchist argument for, which is that you know Germany wants to a uh, war of aggression. If it wins, it's going to impose autocracy on the rest of Europe, which is going to mean there's not going to be a revolution in Europe. So we should support the, we should support the Republic, which is fighting war of defense and is you know better than like the German state. And other anarchists at the time were like, well, no, um, because this is like a war between rival imperialist powers. They're both, you know, waging wars of aggression uh, and both right. claiming to be waging wars of defense. Um, and we shouldn't, you know, we should not pick a side in this war. Uh, and this led to Kropotkin being kicked off uh, the newspaper that he co-founded. So he co-founds a newspaper in, in England called Freedom. And despite being one of the co-founders, the Freedom Group vote to like expel him from the group. Oh, wow. um, even though he's, you know, one of the most famous anarchists in the world, he literally co-founded the paper. Like because of that take, he gets like kicked out of the group. Um, and, and a lot of the kind of big names. So it's so a minority of the movements disagree with Kropotkin. The majority like disagree with World right. War One. Um, but the minority that agree does include uh, some big names who were friends with Kropotkin. Um, okay. And subsequently, they are like kind of. You know that they're, they're they're kind of just ignored or, or like they massively lose their status in the movement. So these are people like Jean Gros, um, who okay. before were like you know some of the biggest names, and now are basically barely known. And part of why they're now barely known is because of, of their response to World War One, and then the movement's response to that being like you know essentially cancel culture happened. Right. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> uh, so you know, and, and these again were people who were you know like kind of narco celebrities. Um, so it's a kind of weird mixture of. Some hero worship, but also responses to it, and also you know Great. some some celebrities trying not to be celebrities like Malatesta. Well, that's really interesting. Like, yeah, it it, it seems like uh, I mean uh, wherever you know somebody, yeah, there's going to be some level of like uh, admiration, perhaps, and maybe that could translate into like a, a kind of a hero worship. But with much of anarchism, it seems like there's been unattributed information or like it, it's like you're hearing it from somebody who's a co-worker with you so maybe you don't you're not putting anybody on a pedestal can we talk a little bit about how anarchism was and still is built from the ground up and doesn't rely on anyone necessarily having read historical anarchists work i think we've kind of talked about this a little bit with the like say the way that uh co-workers were reading to each other or uh or uh um people uh, who were writing for newspapers for anarchist papers weren't attributed stuff like that um yeah and th you know, there is other things so um for example 
if you, if you read the kind of the big names like Malatesta, Kropotkin, over and over and over again, they'll be like, you know, what I'm saying isn't original. It was collectively produced by a social movement. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I obviously have my own ideas, but also I'm often repeating the ideas that were like collectively constructed. Um, mm. So a bunch of things that are kind of became part of the like core anarchist program were developed by workers and general assemblies in the sections of the first international, so especially in Spain, in the Jura region of Switzerland, um, parts of France and Italy uh, as well. Um, that, that you know th these workers who don't. Sometimes, you know, we do know their names, like there's a guy called Jean-Luis Pindy, another guy called uh, Adhima Schwitzgebel, which is like an incredible name. But they're, they're, these, they, these are kind of uh, delegates, but those delegates will be representing, say, an association of workers it will be listed as. And, you know, I don't know the names of those workers. But, right. if, but if it's a delegate system, then I know Pindy, the delegate for the Paris Construction Union, is repeating ideas that were developed by this meeting of people in, in the in the Paris Construction Union whose names I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are all these ideas where, you know, I'll be quoting it in the book as, you know, Pindy says this, but I know that, well, if Pindy's a delegate, I'm sure that, you know, a lot of the stuff he's saying emerged through group discussions, even if he was right. elected to be the delegate because, you know, he's like the best public speaker or whatever, right? Um, and, and that kind of thing happens a lot where, there are these kind of like nameless workers in the background who appear to have made some kind of theoretical contribution, but I don't actually know the details because, you know, the primary source is just, there was this conference, these were the delegates, this is what they said. Right, um, right. Yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> I guess I like a lot of this stuff about anarchist history. <laughs> so so maybe that's not a surprise that I say, say I like that. But yeah, I quite like that. Uh, a lot that it's like built by consensus of a variety of people with a, a variety of ideas. I thought this quote in the book was quite good. Anarchism was born not of the abstract deliberations of some sage or philosopher, but out of the direct struggle waged by the toilers against capital, out of the toilers' needs and requirements, their aspirations towards liberty and equality. Anarchism's leading thinkers, Bakunin, Kropotkin, and others did not invent the idea of anarchism, but having discovered it among the masses, they merely helped refine and propagate it through the excellence of their thinking and their learning, which I yeah, suppose that, is related. That ties back to what I just said. I can give another yeah. example of it, though. So um, Bakunin, when he first, did, so he's in Italy, and then he goes to Switzerland, and he meets these watchmakers in the Jura who become the Jura Federation. Um, they uh, initially tried to do electoral politics. Uh, to achieve, you know, to build towards socialism, and then they, after trying it, are like this is a terrible idea, and they abandon it. Now Bakunin has reached this same idea independently of them, this opposition to electoral politics okay. strategy. They then meet and are like, oh, we've come up with the same strategy independently of, of one another. We both realise that electoral politics isn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. So rather than it being a case of you know Bakunin, the kind of um, you know Russian aristocrat who's formally uh, educated and knows a lot about Hegel, rather than, you know, he comes up with this idea and then transmits it to workers, instead of a case of, you know, Bakunin, the aristocrat meets the workers, and they both come up with the same idea independently of one another. And are like, right. wow, we agree on so much, let's be friends. And they then, you know, mutually shape each other. It's but Bakunin gives them ideas, and they give Bakunin ideas. Um, as opposed to, you know, Bakunin comes up with it all and then transmits it to the workers who are kind of like a you know empty bottle that he's just like pouring water into, right, um, right, and that's yeah. the kind of thing that you know the quote's referring to. Yeah, so much of this it uh, it seems in contrast to the way I understand the uh, uh, Marxism. I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm nothing against Marx. I, I quite like some of the stuff I've read, and and uh, I have one of my best friends is a Marxist, so <laughs> I really shouldn't. Well, there so are there are you know loads of ideas in Marx that are just from. Like, this is what French communist workers thought okay. in the 1840s. Um, you know, with Marx, there's a similar thing where, like, he's getting ideas from social movements that exist at the time. Um, you know, he, 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 he goes on to, like, you know, attack Proudhon, but, like, when he first reads one of his property, it, it plays a key role in him, like, becoming a socialist um, right. and, and abandoning, like, republicanism and, and becoming okay. a socialist. Um, and similarly, um, you know, he, he thinks that 
he has to like incorporate ideas from social movements. So like when the Paris Commune happens, he reads, you know, about about it and reads the ideas of people involved in it. And that then leads him to change his mind. So, you know, okay. initially he's in favor of uh, conquering the existing state. Um, and then when he when the Paris Commune happens, he draws the conclusion that, well, you know, we can't um, wield the ready-made state machinery. We're going to have to transform uh, the state in order to create an organ that can achieve socialism. And he develops the idea in response to the ideas and practices of the Paris Commune and you know, the, the workers and revolutionaries who were like involved in that process. Ah. Um, and what happens is that, this is pretty, really complicated, I haven't read about it in a while, but as far as I remember... Kowski is a German uh, Marxist. Um, he, he formulates a theory which explains the development of Marxism in Germany specifically, which is that you have these revolutionaries who you know have studied Marx and Engels writings and, and other thinkers, and you have these kind of trade this trade union movement that's independent and that is you know struggling for immediate reforms through through uh, you know going on strike and so forth. And there's this merger between these revolutionaries with this like scientific socialist theory and these you know trade union movements, and this then results in in, in social democracy, which is the merger of you know the, the, these kind of working class movements and ideas with the scientific socialist ideas that come from Marx and Engels. Mm. And what happens is then the Marxists uh, repeat this model and start thinking that you know you have to bring revolutionary consciousness to uh, the workers. And the workers by themselves won't develop it through their own ah, struggle. Interesting. Even though this isn't how Marx himself <laughs> developed his ideas. Right. Uh, and even though it's something Marx didn't think, and even though the history of anarchism directly contradicts it. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> right. so, so what was like a, a, a correct description of how social democracy arises in Germany was then mistakenly universalized uh, by, you know, mm. not all, but by some Marxists into a claim about like socialism in general. Um, interesting. But yeah, and I haven't read about this in a long time, but this is my, my recollection. It, uh, I guess in a way it also makes me think of like, cause, uh, I think Mao, uh, talked about like the mass line and like, uh, like, uh, being open to criticisms from, from within the party or what have you. Like, uh, again, not a Maoist, just something that I seem to recall him, him being open to, uh, not, not just his ideas, but other people's ideas from, uh, and the, uh, the education of the people and, and feedback, kind of a feedback loop, right? Like for the book, you really focus on a very specific time and place and form of anarchism. Why is that limited? And why is that a strength? Um, so the reason why, so the book focuses on 1868 to 1939. Um, and the reason why I picked that is because, well, why 1868? It's because that there's several things there. So there's like a Congress in the International, which adopts um, the collective ownership of land as, as a goal, in addition to the collective ownership of means of production, which everyone already agreed on. And this is like a key point in the emergence of like anarchism as a social movement, is, is that Congress. Second of all, it's okay. when Bakunin joins the International and also founds a group called the Alliance, um, which has a program that he writes, which is like him advocating anarchist ideas uh, in a way that like he's kind of in 1866, he's like moving in this direction, but he's yet to like fully adopt it. And then 1868 is when he's like fully adopting what he would later call anarchism, but doesn't. Yeah. Right. Um, actually, he doesn't use the word anarchism, he uses the word anarchist as far as I remember. Anarchism as a term generally only appears like around 1880. Uh, although okay. originally previously been used in the 1850s by one guy called Joseph de Jacques, but in terms of the movement, it, it takes them a while to go from anarchist to anarchism. Anyway, tangent. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and so that's kind of a, a good starting point, 1868, for, for, you know, when it arises as, as a, begins to arise as a social movement. Um, and then it ends in 1959 because that's when the Spanish Revolution ends. It's often okay. kind of a, a Markov point historians use for like, it's kind of arbitrary because like, you know, anarchism in the rest of the world kind of continues uh, right. <laughs> as before, you know, it doesn't suddenly like stop. <laughs> um, and obviously the Spanish anarchists that survived when say fled to like France or Latin America and like continued to do stuff. Um, 
So it also doesn't really apply to Spanish algorithm, but you know, it's kind of like an arbitrary date that historians use to like mark off different uh, periods. Um, and the kind of obviously, you know, since anarchist history continues, it's like, well, why didn't you include that? And it's well because you know you can't cover everything in one book. Um, you know, <laughs> if I cover like the 19, there yeah, is, yeah, if you cover the 1950s, then that means you have less space to cover everything else before. Right. There's kind of you know, the book has to has to be so many words. <laughs> Um, yeah. And also, it's just because you know, that it's like I'm I can only speak English, and m almost all anarchist theory is in other languages. Right, and it hasn't even been translated, but a lot has been translated for the time period I'm interested in. But the same isn't true for afterwards. So, like you know, it's really uh, hard to find translations of like you know what Spanish anarchists were writing in like the the, the 50s or 60s. Um, in a way that, you know, I can read a lot of stuff about, say, what they were saying in the 19th century. Um, and so partly why I don't talk about later stuff is just because there's a limit to how much I can really know about it because there are so few primary sources uh, that right. are available for me to read. And there's all, there also isn't really much of a secondary literature. So as you know, a few books that talk about it, like a, a book I think recently came out about, about anarchism in Uruguay, in like the mid 20th century but that's like really oh, recent cool. um and a lot of times you know when you're reading anarchist history books that try to cover everything you will notice that they get increasingly kind of less detailed and vague as, as things get more recent <laughs> yeah. and it's yeah. because they have they have less things to like draw upon um yeah. and and you know there have been some stuff that has really gone into those details like there's a really good book about the history of anarchism in america by i think a guy called cornell which does cover you know the 50s and the 60s and so forth and does go into all that detail. But this okay. is kind of a field of anarchist history that's only really beginning to emerge in the past uh, few years and is still, you know, there's still so much work to do. And right. so, you know, I didn't feel comfortable to like make claims about that given how little inf how, how, how how little information there is for me to draw upon. Fair. Um, yeah, that's fair. Uh, you you say in the book that the mission one of one of the missions of the book is to demonstrate the intellectual sophistication of historical anarchist political theory. And uh, I, I think that that really struck home for me because I've all, one of the criticisms that I often hear from non-anarchists is that it's such it, they think of it as a shallow theory or it's not very not very deep or in, uh, there's not much to it. And I, I always I reject that outright. But also, it's nice that now that like there's all these books out out about it, and now yours is one of them. Yeah, so so I kind of like I have like an axe to grind to be honest. So like, <laughs> I read these kind of like I, I like I know academic books where there will just be like you know anarchist theories full of logical inconsistencies, and then like not explain you know they just assert it and then move on. Like that there's a, a famous intellectual called Desire Berlin who generally misrepresents everyone he talks about. Um, but he, 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 you know, says these things about Bakunin in ways like, you know, there isn't really ideas. It's just kind of like emotions and, and, and like, mm. and, and like, there isn't like really ideas behind it. Or like Joseph Schumpeter uh, will say that, oh, you know, syndicalism wasn't really a set of theories and ideas. It was more like a vibe. It's kind of basically what it says. And, and <laughs> I think you know, there's always problems like this. Yeah, where, where academics essentially just make things up in order to like... <laughs> Yeah, and just kind of mis they, they don't even, and or or they'll try to like write critiques of anarchist theory, but then again, just like misrepresent it and show they haven't really understood it. Uh, yeah. Like this happens especially with Kropotkin, which is especially Kropotkin and Bakuna because they're the two authors that kind of academics who aren't anarchists are most likely to have written about because they're two uh -huh. of the biggest names, and they just get kind of systematically like misrepresented um, and talked about in like really patronizing ways. So they'll always be like. Um, you know, Kropotkin is, has this like childlike view of humans and you know, say things like that. Um, and when you've read that so many times, it kind of gets, it got under my skin and I was like, okay, sure. I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I'm on a mission. I want to show that like they, you know, even if you disagree with the ideas, they are really sophisticated and complicated and well thought out and they form this yeah. like system and it takes a long time to like, I was like, okay, I'm going to figure out what that system is, explain it in clear words, and then people who don't want to spend like you know ten years reading nothing but dead anarchists, they can read my book and be like, okay, I have some idea of what they thought. That was like the that's goal. Perfect. Um, that's what I kind of set out to do. 
you know, I don't expect like someone working, a, you know, a, an exhausting job, say working at an Amazon warehouse to like read, you know, the complete works of Bakunin or something like, right. you know, that, that's not a reasonable <laughs> expectation. Um, yeah. But I thought, okay, I'll read all the dead people, synthesize <laughs> it into one book. Then if you're, you know, tired and overworked, you can, you know, slowly read this book and you'll get an idea of what, of what historic anarchism is and hopefully it'll help you know, you develop your own ideas about what you think and about how you think, uh, you know, we, sh we should try to change society. Um, For sure. And obviously, yeah, other people can judge if I, if I succeeded, but that, that was that was the mission. Well, I can tell you that uh, the stuff that I've read so far, it, it's quite accessible. Like, uh, I found that it, it's an easy read. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been reading it before work in the mornings. And then when I get a chance, when the kids go to bed, I read some and yeah, I find it to be quite a good read. So, good to hear. I guess uh, we're at the end of the show. So the only thing left is uh, assuming you want to be found. Where can people find you? So I, yeah, uh, uh, I'm Zoe Baker or Narco Back or Narco Zoe, depending on the platform. I need to make it uniform at some point. <laughs> um, yeah. But I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Although now it's X. Um, I, I, I mainly like make YouTube videos um, and obviously also there's my book, which um, you can get from AK Press directly or from, you know, if you just Google and find like a, because there's, you know, so there are some people say in Europe can't just order it from America because the shipping costs are so expensive. So like try and find your own like, you know, local bookseller, even if it might be Amazon, but like because it really varies depending on the country. Right. Um, and the book, you know, to reiterate, is Means and Ends, The Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Europe and the United States. Um, yeah, and, I've got my copy yeah, back here. You can also buy an EPUB um, if you don't <laughs> like a physical copy. I've been told an audiobook's going to happen, but I don't know when. Very cool. Yeah, audiobook is something that I think a lot of people really, uh, they really appreciate an audio version of things. So, very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, unless there's something else to add, then I, I'll... Yeah, no, I think I, I tried my best. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it was nice sure. talking. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie Athope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skepticalleftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skepticallefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on, you on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or Spotify would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for all of my links or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for watching or listening. Make sure to leave a comment and on the video or in my on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. <laughs>